I love the Hebrew Bible reading this morning from Micah. If you know anything from Micah, you know this passage. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. The choir sang about loving kindness this morning. Beautiful, beautiful concept that we don't give enough credence to. How important kindness is. It's one of the most important things, one of the most undervalued things in life. But this is the argument used by any parent. How many of you are parents out here? How many of you have ever had a bone to pick with your child? Because that's what it is when God says, I have a controversy with my people. I have a bone to pick with you. And God says, what have I done to you? Anybody ever say that to your child? What have I done to you? Oh, I know. I took you to Disney World. I fed you. I gave you a new bicycle. That's what God is saying here. What have I done to make you so mad at me? Answer me. Oh, I know what I did. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. I gave you Miriam and Moses and Aaron. I gave you leaders. I brought you through the bad times, King Balak of Moab and Balaam, son of Baor, and all those things that happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you might know my salvation. And what do I ask from you in return? Does God ask for burnt offerings? No, not anymore. But even in the day of burnt offerings to say calves a, a year old, that's a big offering. A year old calf is not a calf anymore, is it? It's like a big old cow. It was something that costs a lot of money that would be a gift of extreme value. And then it gets crazier from there. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Thousands of rams. That is not something you would have even if you were wealthy, was it? A thousand male sheep? Let's ask the ag agronomists over here. If you have a, a flock that has a thousand male animals in it, is that a huge flock or what? Uh, that would be a little crazy, right? Is that what God wants us to sacrifice? No. And then it gets even crazier. 10,000 rivers of oil. Oil, a very, very precious commodity back in the day. Remember the story, don't you? The woman who loses her coin, what does she do? She lights the lamp during the day, unheard of, because oil was so valuable. But she was so upset over losing one coin out of her ten that she has to light the lamp. Believe me, she blew it out as soon as she found that coin. But even before the party started, she blew out the oil lamp because it was such a precious commodity. Is God wanting 10,000 rivers of oil? No. And then the firstborn of, for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Because there was a time in the history of Israel when the kings did what was evil in the sight of God, where they would sacrifice their own children to God, thinking that would bring them power and glory and fame and more prestige. No, that's not what God is asking of us. God is saying to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. That's what God wants from us. Nothing crazy, nothing over the top. But we try to make it more than it is, don't we? If I said, if we read this in a modern translation today, it would be, i got a bone to pick with you, people of Ephrath. What am I asking of you? Am I asking you to bring $10,000 to put in the offering plate? Am I asking you to give your life for the church? Am I asking you to spend all your time under these walls and this roof? No. All I want from you is that you do justice, you love kindness, and you walk humbly with me. Nothing hard to do. But let's go back to the cross, and then let's put the cross into the passage from Matthew's Gospel. The Sermon on the Mount. How many of you went to school where you had prerequisites before you took the big courses? What were some of your prerequisite courses that you had to take? I was an English major. Everybody had to take freshman comp. Who? Everybody hated that course. How many of you took calculus before you took algebra one? Anybody do that? I have to take the basics, right? This is Jesus calling the disciples up that mountain, and the crowd follows him. Why would the crowd follow him? Because he's been teaching in their synagogues, which means he was a teacher, a rabbi. We find out in scripture early on that Jesus is literate. He can read. Very unusual for a first century son of a carpenter. He could read the scripture because he unfolds the scroll of Isaiah. He knows exactly what he wants to read. And, and that's in Luke's gospel. But we know he can read. We know that he is a teacher. We know that he's a healer. And he has picked up where John the Baptist left off saying, Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. We read that last Sunday, didn't we? Now, what is he doing? But he's traveling around. And he's healing people. And in the first century, a healer's fame traveled quickly. Because if you could afford a doctor, you wouldn't want to go to a first century physician because they'd probably kill you instead of cure you. We're talking an age where a fever was the death of someone. We're talking where a cut on your hand could lead to 
a disease that couldn't be healed, an infection that could not be healed. And so people have heard this man can heal, and they flock to him. So they're on the hill, and he's teaching his disciples, and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's surrounded by poor people who have followed him because he was not followed by the wisest and wealthiest in the land. He was followed by poor people who had no hope. They saw him as a sign of hope, and they follow him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit, not the same as Luke's gospel, where it's a sermon on the plain, where they're not on the mountain, they go down to the valley, and they're all on the same level. And what is that one? It says, blessed are you who are poor, blessed are you who are hungry. This is the poor in spirit, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Poor in spirit really is the people who have come to understand that God is all they have. Their only hope, their only sustenance, their only chance in the world is God. It's like you hit the wall and you understand God is there. And if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, we can get that. Blessed are you who are meek. You who are meek are blessed. Say that to someone who's been bullied. Now, I, I listen to a podcast for preaching. And one of the women on the podcast talked about this passage and talked about her childhood. She was nine years old, and the same girl beat her up every day after school, just beat on her. And as she was running from the girl, she ran up to her porch, and she turned around, and she said, I can't hit you back, because Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, and blessed are the peacemakers. And I will make peace, and I will be meek. The girl hit her anyway, hit her really hard. But then she said, years later, her cousin lived in the same town where they had grown up and was friends with this little girl when she became a woman, and she said it never ever left her that this woman, when she was being hit, talked to her about not hating her in return, loving her because she was in Jesus Christ. That's kindness. That's loving justice and walking humbly before God. But blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We get that one. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Are you kidding me? Somebody yell out baloney on that one. You're blessed if you're persecuted? Baloney. Do you feel blessed if you're being persecuted? No. Thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn's got the right answer there. She's the only one who's saying, no. Blessed are you if you mourn. Anyone here ever grieved the love of someone they've lost? Anybody here ever grieved? You know you have. Do you feel like you're blessed at that moment? No, you don't. You feel like your heart's being torn from your chest at that moment. Blessed are you when people revile you. That means when they hate you. Do you feel blessed if you're hated? Do you feel blessed when you're persecuted and all kinds of evil is said against you? Twice since I've been in the ministry, I've received death threats. But you don't really think of being a United Methodist pastor in the 20, 20th century when I was ordained, or the 21st century now. I received death threats once for having a family stay with me who had a controversy with the town where we lived because the man had been subpoenaed to testify in court on a federal discrimination charge against the place where he worked. And he was asked to testify and to say the things he had heard. He had heard terrible racial epithets being said against other people that he worked with. And when they said, what did you hear? And he said words, and he said the N-word. He was called to testify on what he had heard, not on what he had said, but the local newspaper had put Michael Zimmerman sat on the stand and said these things. He was threatened by both sides of people in the argument, those who brought the case against the, the company and those who worked for the company. And they said, we're going to burn your house down. And they had a brand new baby daughter. And they said, we're going to burn your house down with your baby in it. So they stayed with me in the parsonage because I said, come and stay with me. And I got calls saying, we're going to burn the parsonage down with you and them inside. That's just one instance of things that happen. Did I feel blessed at the moment? Malarkey. Balderdash. Not exactly. I trusted God that God was going to protect us, and God, in fact, did. But I slept with one eye open that whole week that they stayed with me because I didn't know what was going to happen. We don't always feel blessed, do we? It's just like the cross. The cross. What is it called? A foolishness to the Gentiles and a stumbling block to the Jews because Jews were being executed on the cross right and left by Rome. Rome, the occupying force that had taken over their land, the holy land, the land promised them by God. They had taken it over and they were living under oppression in God's land. They didn't feel that they were very blessed at that time, did they? 
And the cross was such a bad word. They couldn't even say it because they were decent people. They wouldn't even say the word cross. Foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews because the Greeks thought this was just barbarism at its height. But what do we read here? That God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Your own call. Not call to the ordained ministry, not call to anything but to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, your own call. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were powerful, not many of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame what is wise, which is exactly why God called me into the ordained ministry, because I can be foolish beyond your wildest dreams. But God found something in me that could be used, and God nurtured it and brought it to fruition. And... I don't know anyone who has been called to ministry. Mark, I don't know about you, but you didn't stop and say, what do you mean me, Lord? Are you kidding me, Lord? You've got to be kidding. God must have a sense of humor if I am called to the ministry. Now, some of you know Jane Benikoff, who works with our food pantry. I grew up with her kids in church, and there were four Benikoff kids and two Kofiel sisters, and we all sang together in a group, and we all did Bible study together, everything else. We were really a team. One day we sat down and decided to list out who might go into the ministry in order. There were five names on the list. Mine wasn't even included because people said, Terry can't go into the ministry. She's too crazy. She's too weird. She's too balderdash, they said when I said I was called. We've got to get past that. We've got to understand that God calls and uses all sorts of people. And God is not asking us to do anything ridiculous. God is asking us to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God. It's all that's required of us. That is in response to what God has done for us. Now, Albert Einstein had a saying that the definition of insanity, not foolishness, but insanity, is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Don't be insane. Be foolish. Be foolish in your belief. Tell someone about Jesus Christ because... The world does not know. I keep telling you, it's up to you all. It's up to me to tell people beyond these walls what we believe. We've got to be bold with our evangelization. We've got to tell people, not to go up to somebody and say, are you saved or I, do you know where you're going when you die? Those are not questions that invite a good response. Those are questions that seem more like an accusation to people who don't believe. But tell someone what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Tell someone about your brokenness, which is why AA groups all over the world are growing and growing and growing. 12-step programs grow because people don't have to go and pretend they're anything better than they are. They go in and say, I once was lost and now I'm found because of God and Jesus Christ. God is my higher power. God is the one who brought me out of addiction into new life. We need to do that with our old lives too. Maybe your old life wasn't that bad. Maybe you were not such a terrible sinner. Remember your life before Christ. Remember your life before the church, before the love of God came to you, before you had brothers and sisters who carried you when you needed carrying, who walked with you through the dark valleys of your life. Remember those days and share what it was like and let someone know what it is to be in Jesus Christ made new. So go into the world to be foolish. Go into the world to say stuff that doesn't seem right to anybody else because this is God. God who took a baby, a human baby in the first century. God who let that baby grow and live among us and know what it is to be human, fully human, while he was still the Son of God, fully human in all that he did. Tell them about how Jesus grew up and turned water into wine and then at the Last Supper turned wine into his life-giving presence in our lives. Tell somebody how crazy it is and that you believe with all your heart that Jesus died for your sins on the cross, was buried, and three days later rose from the dead and is ascended into heaven where he sits at God's right hand and he's going to come again to judge us, the living and the dead, to take us with him so that we might be with him forever. Tell somebody that story. Tell them it's not as crazy as it sounds because you believe it with all your heart. And if you start sharing that crazy, wonderful story of salvation, you will bring others to the truth of God and Jesus Christ. I promise you that. Don't be insane. Don't just go out into the world and say, nice to see you. As he said, nice to see you. Why don't you come to church with me? Because our church needs money. That is not the way to tell people about Jesus Christ. But go into the world and say, I want you to come to church with me because I want you to have a family. 
I want you to know what it is to be loved. I want you to know what it is to be cared for and nurtured. I want you to know who Christ is for you because I found my life in Jesus Christ. So go into the world with that kind of foolishness. Leave the insanity to others. Amen. Amen.